Chris, you wanna you wanna tell us yeah. something? I'm I'm gonna be quite brief here uh, for a variety what? of reasons. What? Come on, that seriously? doesn't sound right. <laughs> um, Ah, welcome to Thanksgiving, everyone, and welcome once again to Free Associations from the Boston University School of Public Health, the Public Health and Medical Journal Club podcast. For anyone who is as confused by the latest health study as I am by daylight savings time, are we are we in daylight savings time or did daylight savings time just end? I think we're in daylight losing time. <laughs> Which is it? We lost. Well, we lost an hour. It's sunnier in the morning and darker in the evening. Right. But is that, are we in daylight savings time or did we just end daylight savings time? It seems to me it should have ended, but people tell me it's just begun. I think this is of no interest to all of our listeners. Huh. Not not in the United States. Yeah. Oh, oh well, what about, they have it in other places. The UK has it, doesn't it? I, yeah, I don't, other places I have don't it. know, but you know, China, China not only does not have it, but they only have one time zone for the entire country. How can that be? And it is a very wide east-west country. Oh my gosh. So it's like, you really think about those poor people who are way out in Xinjiang, you know, when Beijing is up at, you know, 8 a.m. and doing its thing, they're all up at 8 a.m., except for them, it's effectively three in the morning. Oh my goodness. It's really, um, I did not know that. Kind of well, wacky. Anyway, I am Matt Fox from the Departments of Epidemiology and Global Health, and I am here with Chris Gill and Don Thea. Good afternoon, Matt. From the Department of Global hey, Health. And we are from Boston University School of Public Health. As always, we are here in the Boston University Godly Studio. Now, first, I want to give you a word from our sponsor. Can I interrupt for a second? Yes. I just checked the list of all of our listeners in the countries of origin, and there are no listeners in China. Really? Really? We need to do something about What's that. What's wrong with them? How do we uh, how do we get the podcast? Oh, I'm out sorry. There? I'm sorry. There were five, but they're they're gone. They're long gone. Well, oh, yeah. they disappeared. There there were four, there were four in the one quarter about a year and a half ago, and then there was one the quarter after that, and there haven't been any since. Oh. Huh. Well, anyway, listen. We are now in November. The United States midterm elections are over. It is time for everyone to come together, and I know of no better way to bring people together than the Population, than the health, population exchange. health Exchange website. It really... <laughs> I do. You do? Yeah. Uh, Football. It just makes everything okay. Beer. So this is Beer. the Boston University School of Public Health Resource Hub for Lifelong Learning, and it has all the things... All the tools and classes you'd need to be an amazing public health professional and a lifelong learner. So go ahead and check it out at www.pophealthex.org. You can head there and you'll find this podcast as well as many other population health learning programs and tools. And just a reminder, we are now gearing up for PHX's Winter Institutes. The first time we are doing this online and you can sign up for courses in GIS, biostatistics and story mapping. So go to www.pophealthex.org where you can learn more. A reminder, as always, we would love it if you'd go on and give us a rating on iTunes or any other podcast app. We've found some on other sites. I can't Stitcher. remember. Stitcher. Stitcher. Um, it was one lone haiku poem well, at the bottom so, of Stitcher. Okay, so that's what I wanted to get to, which is we we asked uh, several episodes ago for people to give us haiku ratings. That was a Chris Gill request. And they, they, they did. They did. We got five of them that I know of. So let me read them to you. So Anna811 says, come and listen to some engaging podcasters, science and data jokes. Chris, <laughs> does it check out? Uh, is that 575? Five, five? I don't know. We have Here's to the... count the syllables. All right. Well, you come back to it. Then uh, Burge314 says, two doctors and an epidemiologist try to stay on point. That sounds right. <laughs> uh, Mets... More difficult than it may appear. Matsuo Bash... Basho? Basho. That's, that's, which, the, which that's the original the... haiku master. Exactly. So somebody registered as the very, name of, of a... Very classy. Yep. It's Wacky Science, Still Moon... Cold sky. <laughs> no, Matt says. I like that. Yeah, that works. works. <laughs> I like that That's one a really lot. Good. Uh, Marigold, the best journal club that you may ever attend. Join to laugh and learn. Yeah. And then Andrew J. Fiore, you'll learn something new, like how to critique methods. You'll also giggle. <laughs> or guffaw. Yeah. So I'm pretty impressed. And we, well we done. so well we done. said we would give a, uh, a mug to listeners, but we haven't been able to identify them except for one. So if you are one of the uh, uh, writers of these haikus, tweet us or let us know, get in touch with us, and we will, uh, we'll find a way to get you a 
Population Health Exchange mug. We should get them, get them a Free Associations mug and a Free Associations t-shirt. I think that's a great idea. Nick, can you uh, start making some t-shirts? We are, Oh, I forgot we have no budget. Oh, there is that problem. <laughs> okay, well. That's where ZipRecruiter comes in. ZipRecruiter. <laughs> Um, so there were also some really nice reviews on iTunes. So thank you to all of you who have taken the time to write out a, a review. They have been greatly appreciated. And I also want to say we're up to over 1,400 listeners per month. And we had 9,000 downloads in the last 90 days. Now, I'm not so good at math, but to me, that's about 100 downloads per day, which is uh, pretty awesome. Wow. Yeah. So we thank all of our listeners. We really appreciate it. There's a few other laggard countries I'd like to point out. Laggard. Laggard countries. Laggard. There was only one download in in the past two years. So Myanmar. Myanmar. Get up your game. Trinidad and Tobago. Bolivia. Yeah. Well, they usually go together. Uh, Can't have one Montenegro, I was like Coast, left, Costa left Rica, for crying out loud. They don't listen to us in Costa Rica? No. Well, we they, need... they have once in the last, uh, from the very beginning. Are you right. not feeling ashamed so, because of Belize? Egypt, Lebanon, Slovakia, and Slovenia. So, so Nick, can we get a travel budget? Because we need to go uh, <laughs> trolling for listeners. We should yeah. go to Belize. All right, we're in. All right, now onto the show. It's a land of ease in Belize. So today in our first segment, which is our Journal Club segment, (laughs) I'm just going to fight through it. We are going to look at two studies. So a pair of studies that looked at the impact of asthma medication dosing. Then in the uh, second part of the podcast, which is our deep dive, we are going to look at a paper which uh, was focused on the impact of ad hominem attacks on belief in science, which I have to admit, I had to actually look up the the definition of ad hominem because I knew what it meant, but I didn't know exactly what it meant. And then in our third segment, which is our amazing and amusing, we will get into some things that make us laugh out loud or just made our lives a little bit better. Mm -hmm. So... Let's get into segment one. So we are going to talk about two articles, a pair of articles which were both looking at the dose of asthma medication uh, and the the impact on uh, asthma results. Uh, and they were both published in the same issue of the New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, the first was by author, first author, uh, Tricia McKeever of the Department of Epidemiology and Public Health at the Nottingham Respiratory Research Unit in Nottingham, and it was entitled Quadrupling Inhaled Glucocorticoid Dose to Abort Asthma Exacerbations. And then the second was published by first author D.J. Jackson of the Department of Pediatrics at the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and Public Health. This one was a, um, if I remember correctly, it had a... Um, uh, a group title as well, which was the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute Asthma Net. So that gives you a little more context on that one. Uh, and this one was entitled Quintupling Inhaled Glutocorticoids to Prevent Childhood Asthma Exacerbations. Now, I looked up the headlines on this, and I have to admit, I failed miserably in that uh, I, I was only able to pull a few from each Um, because I got distracted. So I'll just give you a couple, which is uh, quintupling inhaler medication. Quintupling inhaler (laughs) medication may not prevent asthma attacks in children. That's from Science Daily. Uh, Upping inhaler use may not help kids with asthma. Could stunt growth, says Healthline. Uh, And then this from the second one, serious asthma attacks reduced by temporary quadrupling of steroid inhaler study finds. That's from Science Newsline. And serious asthma attacks reduced by temporary quadrupling of steroid inhaler. That's from Science Daily. So, Don, can you... um, can you give us a uh, an overview of of what these two studies were about? Uh, yeah, so the the two studies were, um, as Matt said, both published in the New England Journal, and they were remarkably similar, really, in their approach and what they were trying to do, but they, the methodology was slightly different. Um, I think it's important to understand that asthma is a really serious disease, and um, it's a disease of developed countries and developing countries. It's a disease of poverty, and it can be lethal, and it's a it can be a, a very debilitating disease. And the way it's typically treated is that um, if, if you have um, asthma that is difficult to control, typically you will be put on um, chronic steroids. And there are several levels of sort of increasing kinds of therapy, whether it's a bronchodilator or a steroid, that you're put on depending on how severe your disease is. And these authors cite the fact that there had not been a real prospective test of whether 
a, an increase in the use of inhaled glucocorticoids or steroids on the setting of chronic steroid use. Inhaled so, steroids, right? Inhaled steroids mm -hmm. in terms of the maintenance of, of asthma had ever been evaluated in children. There was, mm. there was one study that was uh, they cited from a Cochrane review, which seemed to indicate that increasing um, steroid use when you have an exacerbation in adults, in fact, um, seemed to be helpful. So they were asking the questions, is the same, um, think, can the same thing be observed in children? And so the first study, which was the, uh, the Jackson study, where the uh, doses were quintupled, they enrolled children who were 5 to 11 years old who um, who'd been uh, diagnosed with asthma and um, had one attack within the last year, but they were on maintenance doses of um, steroid. So like a, like a severe attack? Like one a, severe attack, uh, yeah, like in, a, the, in the last year. But a, ye a yellow zone or beyond the attack? Well, I'll get to that. Okay. Um, and that they had to have mild to moderate um, and persistent asthma with um, step two therapy. And, and the, 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 what I mentioned before was the therapy can go from one all the way up to five. And these people could only be at step two, meaning that it was somewhat, somewhat mild. Um, and that they, there's a, something called a child asthma control test that had to be um, greater than 19, meaning that, again, that was the, the higher the number, the better controlled they are. So mm -hmm. this cohort of children that they enrolled were relatively, uh, even though they were steroid dependent and inhaled steroid dependent, they were on the better ed, ed, end of the spectrum. Um, they could have had no more than pr uh, two prednisone, prednisone attacks in the last six months. Prednisone? Prednisone steroids. Steroids. So, yeah, so, so that's systemic. Sy systemic steroids, right. Okay. That's an important distinction. Um, and so there were a bunch of children that were excluded because their asthma was t um, too severe. So they set this up as a randomized controlled trial, a double-blind randomized controlled trial at 17 sites throughout uh, the United States um, between August 2014 and March 2017. And every kid that was enrolled would have a, a four-week period when they um, were put on these maintenance drugs and they tried to determine whether they were compliant with a diary and whether they could take the maintenance doses. And then at the end of that four-week period, they would random randomize them either to um, a child who would be maintained on their regular level of steroid when they had an impending um, asthma attack, which is what we call the yellow zone. So if they're having difficulty, uh, they're getting woken up at night or they're, they're um, having to use um, more bronchodilators, they go into this, this sort of critical p period called the um, yellow zone. And then the intervention arm, they were given inhalers, which would deliver five times the dose. And um, they, and it was blinded, as I said. The outcome was the, the rate of severe asthma attacks that was treated with systemic steroids. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, if you're, doing, if you're doing badly with asthma and you're not getting better with your inhaled ster steroids or your inhaled bronchodilator, then you need systemic steroids, either, either steroid pills in the, in the form of prednisone or you need to go to an emergency room and get them um, by vein. So they had um, a number of secondary outcomes, um, one of which was time to the first exacerbation and, and treatment failure and the number of treatment failures um, and the number of ER visits and whether there was a hospital stay. So they enrolled 440 children who, and 254 made it through that initial period and were actually randomized. 44 withdrew, 192 completed. Um, the um, year-long observation, I think it was a year, wasn't it? A year-long yep. observation period. Mm -hmm. Yep. yep. Um, mean, the mean follow-up was about 40 weeks, and the adherence to, to, um, to the daily regimen was about 98%. And um, in terms of the primary outcome, there was essentially no difference. And in terms yeah, of... Sorry, can you repeat what the primary outcome was? I, I Was the rate of severe asthma treated with systemic steroids. Got it. So there was no difference in children having to get rescued, in essence, with systemic steroids, whether yep. they, they dose themselves with a high dose or with a, with a low dose. Yep. And likewise, there, were, there was really no difference with respect to any of the other secondary um, outcomes. They did note, however, that the children um, who got the high dose over this, on average, 40-week period grew at 0.23 centimeters less. They, they, their, uh, their, their height attainment was 0.23 0, 0 0.23 0 centimeters. 0.23 centimeters, so, so a quarter of a centimeter. 2.3 millimeters otherwise. No yeah, so, uh, between, between one group and the other. That's a big difference. A huge. That's not a big difference. Uh, that, that, <laughs> I don't think the that, listener can necessarily tell you're being sarcastic there. Yeah. No, I'm being sarcastic. That's not a big difference. Like, <laughs> like no difference. Yeah. Okay. And I think it was only borderline significant. That, but too. that's not what the headline said. Yeah. Plus 0.06, by the oh. way. This is a trend. Oh, stop it. 
So that's that study. Me. Then the second study was by McKeever, and that was done in the UK. And that was a pragmatic, unblinded, randomized trial of, of adults now and teens from 16 years of age and above. So it wasn't five to 11 year olds; it was 16 and above. And essentially, they did they did the um, uh, they took a similar approach. And and in this instance, they asked um, the individuals to quadruple their dose. And it was a pragmatic trial because what they in essence did was they they gave them a written um, set of instructions for what to do when you feel like you're going into the yellow zone. And they would then self-administer that. And the researchers had contact with them only twice during the observation period. And in this um, uh, study, they found that there was, in fact, a difference between the two. Um, There was a uh, 45% of the subjects who were in the high dose had a severe episode of asthma that had to be rescued with um, systemic steroids as opposed to 52% in the low dose. So so the primary outcome was a severe episode of asthma that needed to be um, treated with um, systemic steroids. And in the high dose group, that happened only 45% of the time and in the low dose, um, 52%. So more in the more in the low dose group than in the high dose group. Right. This group d- did seem to find an effect with high dose steroids in terms of time to um, the first severe episode. We've got two separate studies coming coming up with um, different results. And yeah. so the, the the reason that I thought this was uh, Chris found this and sent it around. The reason I thought this was a particularly interesting case to to look at is because. You know, we do look at a, a, a fair number of randomized trials, but we're rarely are we ever in a case where we've got two studies published simultaneously, not by, not necessarily by the, the same groups, but 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 essentially trying the same strategy in which you find conflicting results, and you have this interesting puzzle of why did one find something and the other didn't. Now, it, I should say this is actually a situation that we've actually been in. Uh, before when with some studies that we've done and you know you then start <laughs> to start sleuthing you know what is what is it that explains the differences so Chris what's your and and our experience has become a teaching case that it we has, teach actually, every we, year twice a year twice a year yeah. yeah Chris what's your what's your what's your take on these two studies and you know are they both right or is one right and one wrong or how do we put how do we how do we interpret this yeah no that that is exactly how I was trying to frame this in my mind because it it is possible that they're both right um you know that is to say that, you know, in the um, in the pediatric trial where they quintupled the dose of of inhaled steroids at the first sign of things getting out of control, you know that didn't work. But is it possible that pediatric asthma is a slightly different beast than sure. adult asthma? It's totally possible. And so maybe what we're seeing is that this is a strategy that doesn't work given the immunology of pediatric asthma. So that could be true, and that maybe adult asthma is a different beast, and that you know, quadrupling the dose of your inhaled steroid does help because the immunology and the biology, pathophysiology is slightly different. That is possible. There is another explanation, however, which is that we are looking at very, even though the, the, the questions that the two teams were asking, you know, and the intervention that they used was very similar. One was a blinded, randomized, placebo-controlled trial, and the other was an open-label trial. And so, you know, we we often talk about how we think that placebos and blinding are very important because of the risk of ascertainment bias. And I have to say that the 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 pragmatic design, you know, sexy as it is as a concept. Uh, may also be a problem in terms of the validity of the results because asthma uh, is a, a, a condition that is particularly susceptible to the placebo effect. Okay, can I, can I clarify two points on that, though, first? Uh, first of all, when you say it's susceptible to the placebo effect, is it really susceptible to the placebo effect or is it just simply lack of blinding by not using a placebo is going to lead to ascertainment bias. It's not that it is actually changing anything so much as it's changing the way you're reporting things. Or are you saying it's actually changing my experience of severe asthma? Well, I, I, in fact, I think it could well be both of those it things. Could be. Matt. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't think they're mutually exclusive. Um, I mean, I think we've mentioned on a, on a previous podcast this sort of interesting study where they um, – gave albuterol versus a, an inhaled saline mist. Uh, so it was a, it was a you know, sham albuterol. Yep. And they gave this to patients who were having an ex- asthma exacerbation and then asked them how they felt in response to the intervention of those. Both groups, the ones who got the albuterol and the, and the, 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 the saline, reported that they felt 
better to the same approximate degree. And yet when you did a, a direct measurement of their, their peak flow, like mm-hmm. how much airway is obstruction is there objectively, the ones who got the albuterol improved vastly of the ones who got the placebo. And yet subjectively they were on... on they, they couldn't be discerned. And so your point here is that in the case of the unblinded trial, which is the one that showed a benefit to this treatment, the, the, the lack of blinding, if you knew you were not receiving the, the increased dose, you might both feel different and report things differently so that you wouldn't experience the outcome, which is the, the progression to uh, glucosteroids. Right. I think that's, that's exactly what I'm saying, that, that the knowledge that you're receiving four times you know, this powerful intervention could be very reassuring to people and could sort of head them off that pathway to getting out of control and getting anxious and ending up in the emergency room and getting ready. Zone. So that is another totally, you know, plausible hypothesis here that it is all about study design, and this is why we need blinding. And just to make it totally clear, the implications of that would be that we are overestimating the effect in the adult trial, the one which found a benefit. Uh, and so the, the, what you're postulating is this would lead to potentially the idea that neither one of these trials truly found anything. And that that we're just observing ascertainment by it. Possible. Hmm. That is possible. Yep. I think the other thing is that in the first trial, um, they had more contact with the researchers. They had more contact. Um, they had more visits. Um, and in the second trial, the only real contact that they had with the researchers were, I think, at six and 12 months. So that could have contributed to um, having better control, say, in the maintenance arm in comparison to the high dose arm and sort of biasing it towards the null. Yeah, I, I think that that is true. So if you um, look at the actual uh, table showing the results or the, the you know, they have a Kaplan-Meier curve, which is a curve of, of the, the increasing number of events over time, the cumulative incidence curve, which essentially, one? of the adult trial, which is the one that showed the benefit. Um, the actual benefit that they observed was, you know, what it wasn't. It wasn't huge. Now it wasn't. It wasn't nothing for sure. But it was pretty subtle. It was so. No, it's about seven percent absolute difference. If I if I got this right, severe asthma as- exacerbation in the year after randomization was forty five percent in the quadrupling group, fifty two percent in the non quadrupling group for an adjusted hazard ratio of 0.81 and a confidence interval from 0.71 to 0.92. But if you look at that in absolute terms, so that would be about a 7% difference. Not huge. Um, that's yeah. not massive, but I mean, that's, that potentially could mean that 7% less uh, asthma, asthma exacerbations, which, you know, because it's not massive, I, I, could, I could believe that ascertainment bias certainly explains some, if not potentially, all of this. Um, I also want to point out that if you look at that result, they display so a 365-day period, the increasing rates of 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 cumulative incidence of outcome over time. The y-axis, so the the distribution of participants with exacerbation, they plotted this from zero to 100 percent, even though the maximum value is below what is like about 55 percent, which makes it all look very small. And my question to you is. Are you okay? I mean, are you okay with when people truncate the axis? I realize this is a technical point, but it to make it, it look bigger than bothers me. Yeah, it, it does seem a little bit, you know, maybe not um, intentionally. Yeah, yeah. So de- I, I sort of uh, deceptive. But I applaud the fact that they went from zero to one hundred because you can actually, you know, sort of see. see it, yeah. This is not a, a massive difference. On the other hand, um, it, it, you know, if it's real, it would be meaningful. It would be, I, it would be, it, it would be important. It wouldn't be massive, but it would be important. There, there is a third possibility here. And, there's probably and, many other well, possibilities. There's, there's, yeah, I'm sure there are, but there's a, there's a third one that I thought of. Um, Go ahead. Uh, which is, um, you know, even though the pediatric trial was was um, was blinded and placebo controlled, and therefore from a, a, a clinical trial you know, quality box check perspective, we would say that that is the superior design to the pragmatic open label design. But um, one thing that I, I looked for in the methods and did not see, and, and I, you know, if you guys did see it and I just glossed over it, but I didn't see anywhere when they talk about the the use of the inhaled steroid, whether they were using metered, um, not just metered dose inhalants, but... but um, uh, spacer. Spacer tubes. Um, so spacer tubes, for those who don't know, are, are like, it's like a basically a... a 
a, a plastic cylinder kind of around the dimensions of a toilet paper cardboard tube. Um, and you screw the metered dose inhaler into one end of it and the kid breathes out of the other end. And the idea is that it creates a, a, a a sort of a pocket of mist that is much easier for the child to inhale. Whereas if you just take it straight out of the inhaler, kids, you know, have trouble with this and often mm -hmm. just spray it onto the roof of their mouth. And so they're not really getting into their lungs at all. And so there is a remote possibility that maybe the trial failed because the kids didn't actually get the inhaler, the, the, the steroid at all. Now that would require a complete failure. I was going to say that, it, So it's it, a bit of a stretch. And it, but, and it but, seems unlikely for an experienced group of researchers, but I obviously I have, right. I, I, I couldn't say for sure, but it, it seems to me unlikely. But in, in fairness, I just feel like, you, you know, the three options are they're, they're both right. Option two is that the placebo control one is right, and option three is that the you know the adult trial is right, and the placebo control is wrong because maybe they didn't get the intervention in the way they thought it they were. To put my my thumb on which I think is more likely, my guess is that the the you know I would I would predict that the placebo controlled trial was is probably giving us the right answer, and I'm a little bit more skeptical of the adult trial. Don, what's as a your consequence? Take? I, I think one of the thing that, one of the thing that needs to be mentioned is that it, they report in the um, pragmatic trial that there was a much higher rate of adverse events. And the adverse events that you would see when you take high dose steroid is you can get candidal infection of the mouth and the throat, or you can get dysphonia, which means that your larynx is, is messed up. And you know they're, they're, they're not super bad because they usually resolve when you stop with the high dose steroids, but I think it's something that needs to be put into the equation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And those were higher in the intervention group. Correct. Which with is the high dose expect. steroids. Yeah, that right. makes You'd sense. Expect. So it sort of feels like they did get the intervention. Right. Yeah, I suppose another, you know another possibility here is that 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 let's say these are the same disease, and so therefore you know you can you could treat children as as small adults, which we all know that you can't. But let's say you you theoretically could, is that maybe you know we're really just looking at a distribution here that that you wouldn't expect that every single uh, time you do this trial you get the exact same result. The result that we saw in the beneficial trial was the bigger one, and it saw what we are calling a small effect. I mean, I don't know that that's totally fair, but we're calling it a small effect, 7% difference. Um, you know, maybe the, the second trial is just sort of, there is a distribution. One is a slight overestimate, one's a slight underestimate. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And we're really just sort of looking at what, you know, what would have accumulated had we done, you know, 10 of these trials. Um, I, so I don't know. I mean, I, I have to admit, I, I'm not the doctor here. And so I'm going to, you know, way off uh, out, of, out, me, out over my skis, but it seems to me these are actually different, you know, to, to say that pediatric uh, asthma and adult asthma are the same thing and therefore should respond the same strikes me as, you know, uh, a little iffy to begin mm -hmm. with. Not, not that, I, by the way, none of the authors claim that. We're yeah. just saying these are together yeah. and you could conclude that. I think the other thing is that um, in, in addition to there being differences between uh, children not being small adults and adults is that not all asthma is the same. And the, and sure. the triggers for asthma are not all the same. I mean, there's mm -hmm. exercise-induced asthma, there's cold-induced asthma, there's asthma that, due to smog and asthma sex, due to viruses. viruses and infections and secondary um, cigarette smoke. So we don't know really what the trigger is, and I think it's hard to lump them all together mm -hmm. In, mm -hmm. in, in, that, in that setting. I mean, just, just to sort of add to that, you know, we are, we, our, our research group is very interested in this virus called respiratory syncytial virus, uh, which is, um, you know, has been linked epidemiologically to uh, wheezing disease and possibly asthma. And it's certainly makes you wheeze. Um, and this is a, a disease that is very common in children and, you know, far less common in, in adults. Mm -hmm. And so you might think that like in a population that's, that's at high risk for RSV induced asthma like symptoms, you know, given that we, you know, there've been trials looking to see whether the use of prednisone or inhaled steroids affects the, 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 the course of RSV disease, turns out it does not. Mm -hmm. And so if, if the pediatric population is enriched for exposure to RSV-induced wheezing, you might say, well, that could be a perfectly plausible explanation for why the inhaled steroids don't work, because it's actually not asthma per se, but it is RSV disease in mm -hmm. disguise. And so, you know, could that play a role in this? I mean, the, the, these are all possibilities. Sure. Or, or different sites might have different um, RSV seasons. Yeah, That's right. And right. You know, there's 17 sites throughout the United States, and it could be that yep. you know they, they did not cover or did cover the RSV season in that site. So, uh, let me throw out one other thing, which is that w w one of the things that interests me about these these studies is these are not, these are, you can think of these almost as strategy trials in that you are not, it, we're not randomizing people with a an event that requires the intervention immediately. You are randomizing people to a strategy for how they're going to manage their asthma. And 
that is the, the the results then are then dependent on how often the event the triggering event occurs so in this case uh worsening of your asthma to the point at which you would need the increased dosage or the the normal dosage presumably if you do this randomized then the two arms should be on average balanced in terms of the number of episodes but they may be very different between trials as to how how you know, severe, how often these events are occurring that require the event such that the, the ability to discern, uh, effects should they be there is, could be different. And in fact, the second trial, the chi- the first trial, excuse me, the, the one in the children, um, you know, you was, had a much smaller sample size and in fact was smaller than, um, what they were, I think what they were anticipating in terms of number of events. And so, um, you know, you could, you could hypothesize that, that, you know, with a bigger study, you might have seen something slightly different. Mm-hmm. And it, it sort of occurs to me that, you know, we talked a lot in our last episode about this idea of, of designing your observational study like a randomized trial. If you think about this in the reverse, if you were doing this as an observational trial where you just went and found cases where people were using, for whatever reason, an increased dosage of cortico- of the gl- steroid. uh, steroid, excuse me, um, you presumably wouldn't do this as a as a strategy type analysis. You would look at individual events that required the uh, use of the of the the steroid itself, and so you would be comparing events as opposed to an entire strategy. It would be a very different analysis. Now, I'm not trying to claim that that makes any difference here. It's just I thought it was an interesting way to think about the differences between observational approaches and randomized trial mm-hmm. approaches, and then they get at different things. Mm-hmm. All right, well. We should move on, but before we do, I want to make just one observation which I found interesting. Did you notice that in the uh, adult study, so that is the uh, second one that you were talking about. The quadrupling rather than the quintuple. Yeah, I was, by the way, I was curious as to why one was quadruple and one was quintuple, but anyway. That's an easy one to answer because in the pediatric trial, the the standard dose of Flovent, which is the dominant corticosteroid used in the United States uh, for asthma control, is uh, metered at 44 micrograms Mm -hmm. per puff. And then it goes up. Um, through a couple escalations, so you can get high, higher strength flow vent, and the highest strength is 220 micrograms, wow. and so that's 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 your quintupling right Chris, there. Chris totally called my bluff there. Wow. Um, so I just thought it was really interesting as I was reading this. So if you look at the um, the the introduction to this, I was just you know it's the New England Journal of Medicine study, and I'm reading. It's remarkably short. Mm-hmm. It is three paragraphs long. It's the way it should be, man. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I don't think any introduction should be longer than three paragraphs. I agree. It's six total sentences. No, I don't have that right. Six sentences up across the three paragraphs? two, three, four, five, six sentences. Six sentences, 215 words. That's awesome. I mean, that is remarkably brief. In addition to which, (laughs) this article has... What did you say? Pithy, brief, and... Remarkably short. I don't know. (laughs) Short and brief. It also has... Uh, one table, <laughs> stop it, one table and two figures, which also kind of surprised me. I mean, yeah. it's got some supplementary, supplementary uh, material. It's got other material on the web, let's just say. Right. But That's I where they get long it offline. Really, really pithy. Pithy, yeah. I think. I like that. The, yeah. I like that. Yep. All right. Well, let's... Uh, <laughs> We've done this to death. Let's move on. So... In our, our second segment, we want to talk about a, a paper that came out in uh, the journal PLOS One, um, which uh, gets into this idea of whether ad hominem attacks on uh, scientific uh, discoveries, scientific claims, uh, has an impact on people's belief in those claims compared to uh, attacks on the science itself. So, so dis, you know, concerns about the actual science versus concerns about the investigator um, and whether uh, one is more effective at dis- getting people to disbelieve a claim or, or the other is. So the paper was entitled The Effect of Ad Hominem Attacks on the Evaluation of Claims Promoted by Scientists by first author Ralph M. Barnes. And I so I had had I wanted to look it up just to make sure I, I truly knew what it meant. So ad hominem is short for argumentum argumentum ad hominem, which is a fallacious argumentative strategy whereby genuine discussion on the topic at hand is avoided by instead attacking the character, motive, or other attributes of the person making the argument. It's a tactic that has come into focus. Well, what's, and so, popularity. So, so what I thought was interesting was the idea that it is 
it is fallacious. But let's come back to to that uh, in a minute. Christian, it might you, not be fallacious. Well, uh, it's not necessarily. It, well, that's kind it, of the point. I think we're going to discuss a, right an attack on a person that is not necessarily fallacious. But anyway, first, can, Chris, can you can you sort of describe the, what they did in this? Yeah, study. no, it was a clever little study. So they they presented a group of, of volunteers, and I, forgive me, I, for, I forget the, the total number who were, were sampled. 439 but, college students and 199 adults. Fantastic. So these, they were given a set of, of factual scientific statements, and they were asked to evaluate how much they bought them, how, how much, to what degree did they believe in these statements. Mm-hmm. And then they did a series of, of sort of randomized permutations of this this um, exposure to these fine scientific facts, and by the way, not all of the not all of the facts were, were truly facts. They they were they were they were often fact sounding statements that yeah, were just made I, up. I, but, I was going to say that I, I don't know they were actually facts. But some you know some of these you know these fact sounding statements um, were also appended with some further contextual information um, that was either uh, information attacking the empirical evidence on which the fact was claimed. Um, so, for example, uh, you, you know, lollipops prevent cancer could have been the fact. I don't, that would Do you be, want to give an, exa- a, a fa- an example? Give me an exact actual yeah, example. Yeah. So, according to Dr. Smith, a climate and energy researcher, nuclear power is just as inexpensive as power from coal, and nuclear power has zero CO2 emissions. So an attack on the empirical basis of that could be to say that, you know, we happen to know that the the, the widget that Dr. Uh, whatever his name used to do this study was not calibrated and is not actually measuring the thing it was measuring, and therefore the data are unreliable. And in fact, I think the actual attack, was, uh, the, the, the scientific attack was that the, uh, the doctor is only considering the actual emissions and not considering the uh, uh, CO2 emissions that would have gone into the process of generating the nuclear energy in the the first place. Right. Something like that. Something like that. Whereas an ad hominem attack, and there are many different kinds of ad hominem attacks, but one could be this study is invalid because Dr. X is incompetent and did not go to, you know, did not graduate uh, from a good university and therefore his, his expertise is in question. So that's a basically saying don't believe the science because the scientist is bad. Mm-hmm. Or another one might be, you know, don't believe the science because Dr. X, you know, is a paid consultant of the uranium industry and has a conflict of interest. Um, or, you know, I think there, there are several others. One might be that um, Dr. X had engaged in fraud in the past and we should no longer tr- trust Dr. X. Mm-hmm. Had engaged in fraud in the past, essentially, or, or recently. Or, or recently. Uh, or the researcher was, was simply sloppy. Right. And, and so when they, when they did their analysis, they basically looked at the baseline value in terms of the, 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 per- the perception by these subjects who had seen the fact alone versus the perception of the, of the people when they saw the fact challenged by an empirical um, you know, take against the data or against the scientific method versus an ad hominem attack against the investigator. Mm-hmm. And what they found, which was quite interesting, uh, and I think why, why you chose this one, is that the ad hominem attacks seem to be more potent uh, in terms of undermining the believability of scientific claims than the attacks on the data themselves, which seems so backwards. And yet, in the era of fake news and... Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, everything being on the web and nobody believing anything anymore. I think this this kind of feels like like I actually kind of buy it. And, it, and I find that um, it's a very cynical thing to accept. But I, I, I totally believe this, this could be true. And it, it, it depresses me. So I, I would say, and I, I agree with much of what you just said there, I, I do think it may be a little bit of an overstatement to say that the ad hominem attacks were... Uh, worse than attacks on the scientific, uh, the empirical attacks. Um, you know, they certainly were a bit worse, but but not much. And it wasn't all of them, which I, I think is also of interest. So um, the the claims that seem to have the biggest impact on the believability of the claim were the empirical attacks. So something's wrong with the science. Um, relevant misconduct, knowing that the person had committed misconduct related to this study, past misconduct, they had committed misconduct previously, or that they had a conflict of interest, whereas they came from a a bad institution, or, you know, they did their study at a bad institution, or um, they were sloppy, really didn't seem to have much of an impact. Right. And and if you can sort of cluster those thematically, the first three, the misconduct, uh, the past misconduct, the current misconduct, and the conflict of interest, those are all basically accusations leveled to the honesty of the investigator. Mm -hmm. Whereas the last two are more towards the competence of the investigator, which is a separate construct. 
Yeah. Yeah. Don, what's your, what was your take on this study? Well, yeah, I, I'm, I'm sort of coming back to um, what you said uh, initially in terms of ad hominem attacks hum, 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 hum. And, and the fact that it relates to these attacks being fallacious. And yep. I think that's really the nub of it for me, because in this instance, these attacks aren't necessarily fallacious. I mean, they are meant to be true. And if in fact, the researcher um, has had relevant misconduct in the, in, the, in, the, in the conduct of this particular study, then I think it's valid for the, for the, the listener to have less confidence in the, in the believability of the, of the scientific assertion. Same thing with past misconduct, because as Chris said, that calls into the question the honesty of the researcher, and same thing with conflicts of, of interest. And, you know, it's, it's, I think being in the scientific business, being in the business of generating scientific information is, is, in, engenders a lot of trust. Mm -hmm. And I think that we all feel very, very covetous of the, the trust that we build up over the course of, of our career. And if, if that trust gets undermined, um, then it really can be an extremely damaging thing for us as researchers, but also it's damaging to the public in terms of, you know, their, 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 their belief in the research that we purport. And this kind of comes back to the discussion we had at our last podcast mm -hmm. where we talked all about this. Which might lead one to be very careful about making such... Uh, comments or observations in the process of a peer review or even an editorial, uh, you know, written to the journal after a paper has been published. But the problem is that, that some of these are, are, are for real. Like we have seen on many occasions, we discussed on this podcast, serious conflicts of interests that appear to, uh, you know, ar arise around the investigators that, that in fact have made us quite skeptical about the validity of the yep. science that we're studying. You know, there's, there, there's, it, it really is a very serious issue. And at the NIH, there's a Center for Scientific Integrity. And there are all sorts of processes that um, funding organizations and universities have to go through if there is any, um, any, any question of the integrity of the researcher or of the, of the research work. So there's a very intact system that, that exists to really try to come to the come to the bottom of, of these sorts of things. Yeah, and I and think it's really important because it, it, it bolsters the <laughs> believability of, of the science. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. just, to, just, to, just to hammer the point home, so the authors say themselves that, um, that, these, that, that, that it may actually be reasonable to interpret these, these attacks as a way to judge the quality of the science, and that they are, not, they are not making the claim that, um, that, that, that these attacks should be uh, should be discarded, and in fact, people aren't. They're actually saying, in some cases, this information. You could make it a reasonable argument that this information would be relevant, and if you were going to do that, it would be the ones that 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 actually turned out to seem to be relevant. It was uh, mis issues of misconduct and conflict of interest, and you know, it seems I, I, as you say. I mean, I'm parroting what you just said, but it does seem to me that conflict of interest and misconduct are relevant information because science is, science is difficult. Science is, is by definition incremental and, and, and somewhat messy when you know, we're not dealing with lab rats. And so it, it's hard to do, and we have to have some uh, ability to judge. We have talked at length about conflict of interests and said that, you know, when we know that uh, a, a study was done by, say, a, sponsored by a drug company, um, that is information that we want to take into account when we are trying to judge the results. It doesn't mean that the result is necessarily uh, wrong, but it is something that we take into account. Mm -hmm. The other thing I... I, I I don't know, so so I don't know how to interpret these because when they talk about these scores, I mean, we are talking about a, a attenuated difference score of minus point eight. Is that a, is that a lot? Is that a little? I mean, the, I, I, mm -hmm. I don't know what we're actually talking about here in terms of magnitude. So something's going on, but I mean, is it is it big or is it small? I, I have a hard time, yeah, they hard time judging. They don't calibrate their scale to give us some incense as to what, just, is that, does they, it matter? They, they yeah. do talk about it. I just have a hard time interpreting mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. um, I also, I, I, find, I don't know about you guys, I found this like a really interesting paper to read because uh, the way that they go about this is very different from the way that we tend to write papers. So they essentially set it up as, here are all my. Here were our hypotheses. We designed this experiment to answer this question. We did the experiment. Here's what we found. Then we designed another experiment, methods, 
Then we and, yeah. oh, no, sorry. Then we had new hypotheses, and we had a new method, and then so we had, had two, new results. Two papers in one, and it just it just like it's really. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I really like the way they sort of go through it. It also had, if you look compared to the last study, which had a incredibly short introduction, this one goes on for for a couple of pages, giving you the explanation and the rationale for why this should be believed. You know. Uh, why this is plausible in the first place, which I think speaks to, again, the differences between, you know, medical fields where, you know, some of the things we need sort of a short introduction, but you can sort of, we could do the experiment and see if it works. Right. Whereas in, in the psychological fields, I think you need more of a construct as for why we would expect right. this to work in the first place, because, you know, we're doing these studies and we could find the odd finding that just makes no sense. So we have to have some rationale behind it. Yeah. I just thought that was, was quite interesting. Yep, I agree. I agree. Anything, any other last points on this? Um, simply that, you know, looking back at, at, at our podcast where we talked about conflicts of interest, the, one, the ones that have stuck out in my mind as most egregious were the undeclared conflicts of interest, where it really felt like the investigator was hiding the conflict. Yeah. Uh, as opposed to, you know, several we, we have noted extensive conflicts of interest in terms of whether they are involved in an intervention for which they have been paid by the sponsor that makes that in, that inter- intervention. Mm-hmm. Um, and we have sort of said, yes, there's a conflict of interest there, but okay, you know, they noted it. Yeah, and, and we're I think okay it, to move on from that. And I think as a result, the journals are becoming much more focused in terms of pulling out any potential conflict of interest in, uh, on the part of the authors. And I know that, you know, five, 10 years ago, when when I wrote a paper, was a co-author on a paper, I didn't have to fill out um, a, a multi-step mm. processed form attesting to any and all conflict of interest. Yep. And now we have to do it for just about every single paper. Mm-hmm. And if any of that is at all related to the subject matter or the funder of the, of the paper that, uh, that you're an author on, it gets put in the, you know, either in the in supplement or at the bottom of the page or in the appendix. And mm-hmm. that kind of transparency, I think, is really important. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So this term ad hominem attacks, I mean, is it, you know, I mean, I think it it's could misleading. be fallacious. It could be not. I mean, we have to make a judgment that I trust the person who's giving me this information. And if I believe it, I think that 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 some of this information is relevant. The the issues of misconduct and the issues of conflict of interest to me are actually relevant if I actually believe they are true. I suppose the issue is I don't know for sure that they're true. You're telling me they're true and I don't know. So it could be fallacious. You could be just making up that, you know, Right, but Conflict. I think that association that you that you spelled out in the beginning, Matt, makes this the at least the title of this paper a little bit misleading because because I think that those those mm. those things that were intended to undermine the, the veracity of the findings were not truly ad hominem because they they, they were, were not, not fallacious. fallacious. Did, but, I, did I? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean, that was part part of why I, I went and looked it up was because I wasn't actually sure when I'm looking at fallacious uh, when I'm look what I'm is defined as ad hominem. Or not, and it says, specifically says a fallacious argumentative strategy. And I don't, I don't, yeah, I don't know that that's completely what we're talking about mm-hmm. here. Um, one last thing I wanted to, 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 or two points I want to end with. First of all, um, and this is, I think this is pretty common in the the psychological research field, but the the whole first experiment was done in college students, mm. and I do wonder whether you know whether we think this phenomenon would be the same in another population. Now, they actually answer that question because they then did it in a completely separate population. And it looks to me like they got almost identical answers. But this idea of like, we, we found it in college students, therefore it must be true when we're talking about uh, psychological phenomenon or you know the way that people interpret things, I, I just have to believe changes. Mm-hmm. The other thing that I found interesting, and this is totally over-interpreting data, as I just said, don't do, but I'm going to do it anyway. So they present the results from these two different experiments, one done in in college students in which they had either or, either you had a scientific attack or you had a uh, ad hominem hominem, attack as they are defining it. In the second experiment, you could have both. You could have an ad hominem and an empirical attack. Um, They found almost the exact same findings Mm -hmm. in both populations. Which was quite surprising. Which is is a bit surprising that there was no additives would be worse. Yes. But what's even more interesting to me is that, again, I'm over-interpreting here, but in both cases there was a slightly increased effect of past misconduct over relevant misconduct. Isn't that interesting? That you were slightly, you know, things were slightly worse. Yeah, if you, we you were slightly that, more likely to... Why would that be true? In both studies. Now, yeah, you know, yeah. I mean, these are... Pr- 
certainly from a statistical but, standpoint, but you did, wouldn't say they were different. But it's just interesting to me that the trend was the same in both. But didn't we just um, didn't we just note that we don't know what the units are, so it's hard to make cr- those kinds of comparisons. Well, we're over. I don't know what the. <laughs> I don't know. This is the overreading hour. I, now, know, so. I don't know what the units are, but but the the difference, the magnitude. Sorry, the 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 direction is the same in both. Mm. Worse for past misconduct than current misconduct. Again, vastly overinterpreting data that shouldn't be interpreted this way. But I just it just struck me as really interesting. Yeah, I agree. I, I was I was a little surprised by that because you would have uh, thought there was a dose effect. Um, should we move on? And then recent is worse than remote. I would think so. Yeah. All right. So let's move on to our our last segment, which is our amazing and amusing, which we want to highlight some of the things that make us enjoy our jobs even more than we already do. A look at the weird, wacky stuff that happens in fields around us or adjacent to us that inspire us or just make our days a little bit better. Uh, Chris, you want to you wanna tell us yeah. something? I'm, I'm going to be quite brief here uh, for a variety what? of reasons. What? Come on. That seriously? doesn't sound right. <laughs> Um, and I, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna combine several of my interests. One of which is is bees, and we're talking no, about are you the kidding one. Me? We're talking about the first bee, uh, thiamine, oh, vitamin B one. Oh, <laughs> so I'm gonna, I'm gonna allow that. I'm gonna allow that it's one. A bee, no, it's a bee I think complex. We have to bees cut are it. complex. I am gonna allow that one. I think that's they funny. Have a complex hierarchical that's, society. That's good stuff. Anyway, uh, I'm gonna talk about a medical mystery, which I, I, I came across. This is in my favorite journal, of course, P N A S, and the author is Natasha. Gilbert. So this is actually a, 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 an edit, a, a scientific review article that I just thought was really cool because I'd never heard any of this, which is talking about um, thymine deficiency at a population level in seabirds and fish. Not bees. Not bees. So not bee complex. We're talking about bee, bee vitamins, bees. but not actual bees. Got it. And so... Um, for those of you who don't know, and I was going to include myself in that because uh, until I looked it up on Wikipedia right before I came online, um, I didn't know much about thiamine. Um, but thiamine was the first vitamin ever discovered. Did you know that, Don? Mm-hmm. I didn't know that. It's the first vitamin. And the way they found it was kind of interesting. They There was... Um, uh, sort of a natural experiment that happened about 150 years ago when people started feeding white rice to chickens. And after a while, the chickens became paralyzed and died. Um, but previously, they'd, been, they'd sort of been feeding these chickens a, a mixed diet that included non-white rice. Now, non-white you make white rice. rice by polishing brown rice. And when you polish brown rice, you remove the coating okay. around the rice, which is where the thiamine is. And so you re- you have removed this critical nutrient from the diet of the chicken. And so that had been, you know, there was um, a lot of people who had this condition called beriberi, which is right. we now know is caused by deficiency of vitamin B1, thiamine. And it, up to 30% of people in parts of China, for example, had beriberi and, um, you know, either had congestive heart failure because of damage to the functioning of the heart, which would be called wet beriberi, or they had sort of parasthesia paralysis and paresthesias of their peripheral nervous system, which we call dry beriberi. But now we know that both of these are caused by thiamine deficiency, leading to a dysfunction in these different organ systems. And so with that sort of background, this um, uh, zoologist who studies seabirds had noticed that in the Baltic Sea, there were, there were all these eider ducks who were paralyzed. Mm-hmm. Um, and because he had known that thiamine deficiency can occur at a population level, he tested to see whether the, 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 you know, the seabirds were thiamine deficient and it turns out they were. And then he sort of proved it by supplementing many of these birds with thiamine. And then they would like, you know, after a couple of days would start flapping around and would eventually fly off. So he sort of made the point. Um, and he also saw that the, there was a secondary effect because the, the laying uh, hens of uh, these eider ducks would produce fewer eggs and the, the eggs were less viable and the chicks would tend to die at a much higher rate. And all of that could be reversed experimentally by just giving the ducks thiamine. And so the question was like, why are these seabirds suddenly en masse becoming thiamine deficient? Mm-hmm. It's a really interesting question. And so what, what, what we should know is that thiamine is found in a lot of plant substances like brown rice, but it's also produced by bacteria um, and, and phytoplankton. And so a a change in the bacteria in the seawater and in the phytoplankton of the seawater, um, where this these the, where thiamine is being synthesized by these microbes, if that happens, you can have a depletion of thiamine in the environment, which then goes up the food chain, and all the things that the the the, 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 the hydro ducks eat mm-hmm. will no longer be a sufficient source of thiamine, and so um, that that is sort of his prevailing hypothesis. But it turns out that there are other 
um, sort of natural uh, incidences where where thiamine deficiencies occurred en masse, like in the Great Lakes, there were there were birds that were having thiamine deficiency, and it turned out that these birds were eating the alewife fish preferentially in their diet, which is a a, a, a fish that is a, is a non native. What do we call these Isn't things? That a wildflower it's a tea in the station. Alps? The alewife, like alewife station. It's a tea station. Alewife. I, thought, I heard you say alewife. alewife. No, not alewife. alewife. <laughs> alewife fish. There's this little sort of round yep. herring-like yeah, yeah. fish that live in fresh water. And the alewife fishes have an enzyme called thiaminase that destroys, that scavenges and destroys thiamine. And so when the, 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 the seabirds in the Great Lakes were eating these alewife fishes, they would get thiamine deficiency. And when you change their diet to bloater fishes, they were fine. And so, you know, what this is sort of like spelling is like, what, what are we doing in the Baltic Sea that is changing the ecology of the food change in this very fundamental way that it has this sort of, you know, sort of immense ripple effect in terms of, of wildlife mm. and could also affect us because, you know, thiamine deficiency in, in Scandinavia is very common amongst people who eat pickled fish, which um, often are fi- the, the kind of fish that they pickle tend to be the ones that have thiaminase production and destroy thiamine. And so, you know, it all kind of fits together. So I I thought this was just like a really interesting medical puzzle. And I just thought it was really cool that it was coming down to this sort of simple factor of thiamine production in an ecosystem and what that does to multiple life forms. That's that's, pretty interesting. And that's Chris being brief. (laughs) Best. (laughs) All right. Don, do you want to go second then? Yes. I could go longer. I know you, you could. could. Well, you actually, have. Thiamine deficiency. No, oh, hey, stop. Stop. Also stop, 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 stop. Blue muscles. No. All right. You said at the beginning of this podcast that this is the fall, right? I did. Fall in New England. Fall in Boston. Not and to be it Thanksgiving. Is, it is my favorite time of year because... Pumpkin spice thing. latte. No. Nope. Nope. The Ignoble Awards. Oh, yes. The Ignoble Awards, which will be being broadcast be on... Being. NPR, Science Friday, Ira Flato, on the Friday after Thanksgiving. So I implore is he one of our sponsors? listeners <laughs> to listen to the Ig Nobel Awards. And what I want to do is I want to just mention a few of the awards that were given out this year. And then right. I want to talk about one in a little bit more depth. Okay, mm. go for it. So the award for- Wait, but aren't you giving away all your amazing and amusings for the next few months if I you am. tell us? Well, I'm not going to tell them. I'm not going to mention them all. Okay. We can spin this out for a while. <laughs> So, so the um, uh, the Ig Nobel Award for Biology went to, and I unfortunately don't have the authors, but if you listen on Friday, you'll hear them, um, went to a series of researchers who demonstrated that wine experts can reliably identify by smell the presence of a single fly in a glass of wine. No, can really? they? Apparently there's a, there's, a, the, there's a pheromone that the fly, the female fly makes which interacts with um, the contents of a wine of glass so that you can immediately smell. I imagine I could drink a fly and I wouldn't even notice. Yeah. yeah. Um, the uh, Ig Nobel Prize for Medicine went to a series of researchers um, for using roller coaster rides to try to hasten the passage of kidney stones. <laughs> Did that work? <laughs> Apparently so. Wow. wow. Um, and the, now I know what to do. The, the, does it matter if you have to do the loop-to-loop? I don't, I don't think it does. It's just no. vortexing. I think is this it's like just, being centrifuge? I think it's just bearing down. Wow. <laughs> uh, the prize for economics was for investigating whether it is effective for employees to use voodoo dolls to retaliate against their abusive bosses. It I'm is. I predict it is. It is. <laughs> is oh, it? Oh, yeah. Uh, apparently so. Yeah. Oh, right. That's good. Good. And good. the Peace Prize went to a group um, for measuring the frequency, motivation, and effects of shouting and cursing while driving an automobile. Oh, my wow. God. I could, one I could I contribute would, data to that experiment. Yeah, you could easily. The one that I... You would uh, not be randomized to the control arm, that's for uh, sure. I'm going to skip the Medical Education Award, which went to a group for... Uh, actually, it was a single, single report um, um, on colonoscopy in the sitting positions. Lessons learned from self-colonoscopy. No. <laughs> was this a guess? Oh. All just in his spare time. Apparently no, so. I don't like that. Apparently wow. so. I do not like that. Um, <laughs> but the, the the one paper that really did Seeing caught, is catch my caught my eye was a study assessing the caloric significance of episodes of human cannibalism 
in the Paleolithic era. Ooh, go ahead. So what they did is they, and apparently I didn't realize this, but there are um, there are a number of different reasons why um, ancient societies engaged in cannibalism. There's nutritional cannibalism, there's ritual cannibalism, and there is warfare cannibalism. Okay. And the presumption that um, that nutritional can- cannibalism um, was 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 du- practiced in these in these societies was that it was a nutritionally good source of food like diamonds so, so they <laughs> so they ask the question what is the caloric uh, what is the 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 caloric quality of um, calories derived from uh, humans gross. in comparison so to gross. to other animals that might have been found at the time did and they, they have did they publish their methods they did. <laughs> They if did. You use the phrase "taste like chicken." I'm really going to be upset. <laughs> <laughs> no, but what they did is they went through an analysis of the caloric value of meat from different species. So, did you know that uh, a human has a caloric value? The muscle in a human has a caloric value of thirty-two thousand three hundred and seventy-six calories, well, approximately. Would I, why would anybody know that? But in comparison, they, they compare this to the caloric value of the skeletal muscle contained in a woolly mammoth, <laughs> which is 3,600,000 calories. This is like the Kobe beef Three. of the Paleolithic era. <laughs> <laughs> That's good to know. That's good to know. <laughs> if you're ever stuck. <laughs> Haven't you ever wondered what is the caloric content of a woolly rhinoceros? I, absolutely. It's, it's 1,260,000 calories. Wow. So we're, we're lean and mean. Uh, we are. Apparently, they, they, they thought that it was, it was a fool's errand so to, to, the, to cannibalize is your, that, so is your that, base for nutritional value. Is that what's in the paleo diet? Woolly right. mammoth? Apparently. <laughs> woolly mammoth? Apparently. Yeah. That, that, I think that would be a shock to many. <laughs> Wow. Well, okay. I, I think that that's in good taste. So, <laughs> no, <laughs> sorry. So, uh, uh, happy on. Thanksgiving, folks. Right. I think we need to chew on that one. Ooh. <laughs> wow. Gets worse. All right. <laughs> Gnashing your teeth there, Matt. So, uh, so I'm going to go back to uh, science and the business of science and the science of science. So, um, we, the three of us, certainly know that science is getting harder and. Existing in an academic environment is getting harder. It's because all the easy facts have been found. And science is changing at the same time. And so we have all of these new metrics that people are using to try and judge the value of science. So, you know, the H index Mm -hmm. is one that people have been promoting for a while. The H index is your number of publications and that have been cited X number of times. So if you have an H index of 10, that means you have at least 10 publications that have been cited 10 times or more. And it's supposed to be this measure of of impact. But it's all, it's a very flawed measure. Mm. Uh, So you're aware of the K index. No. No. So this was uh, pointed to me by, I'm going to make a plug for another podcast, which I really enjoy, which is the Everything Hurts podcast. Dan Quintana uh, pointed me uh, in his podcast to the K-Index. The uh, K-Index was developed by a guy named Neil Hall, and it is described in a paper in Genome Biology back in 2014. And the K-Index, K stands for Kardashian. Oh, no. (laughs) And what this I is, where this is, is a, uh, he developed a measure of that tries to take into account both your references that you're getting, your citations, sorry, excuse me, that you're getting, uh, or citations or references, anyway, um, and the number of Twitter followers that you have. Oh. Yes. So he's a uh, <laughs> source and, and, and readership of source. Yeah. Are you sure it's not the Kanye index? No, no. This is the Kardashian index. And so he, he did some analysis and he found the formula that relates uh, this ratio. So the K index is equal to F of A over F of C, where F of A is the actual number of Twitter followers of researcher X, and F of C is the number of researchers X should have, gi- should have given their number of citations, which is in this formula that's related uh, F equals 43.3 C times to the 0.32 power. So this is the speed of light. Very precisely <laughs> figured out this relationship. Uh, now, uh, the idea here is that if you have a low K index, you're probably uh, not getting the publicity that you would should be deserving for your research. And if you have a very high K index, you're probably spending, uh, you, you have too many Twitter followers, you're spending too much time on that. Now, I was not able to look up Chris's uh, K index because Chris is 
on Twitter, but he uh, doesn't have a Google Scholar page, which is what you need to use the online calculator. But you and I both do. So I looked us up. Uh, uh -oh. you, no, no, you're, you're not doing very well, Don, because no. your number of, of Twitter followers is, is too low. So how, you many were, is, how many does he have? Uh, I don't know. You don't have very many, Don. No, how many do I'm you have? I have a few. Why, why is that? Are you, I, uh, cause I don't like Twitter. Oh, uh, same here. So yours, uh, are John, you going oh, to embarrass me, Matt? But yeah. Don has 21 Twitter followers and, but but a whole lot of citations, so his uh, his score ends up at point zero two seven. So you're not doing so well. No. Got to get some more Twitter followers. No. Wow, Kim Kardashian is a much uh, better scientist. Sandra's going to be really disappointed. My <laughs> Kardashian score was two, so I think I'm in the. They say I'm sort of in the reasonable zone. But let me just tell you how he ends this article by explaining that if your K index gets above five then it's time to get off Twitter and write those papers. <laughs> and then he ends with by saying, if you'd like to discuss this further, please follow me on Twitter at, at he gives his handle, at the time of writing, my candix is only marginally above one. So he's, mm. he's clearly not getting the number of followers that he needs. So we should all go and follow him. K index is now, I assume, what we're all going to be judged on mm. next time you go up for promotion. So... Better get those Twitter followers. Maybe we should gonna, change it to the Sandro Index. We could do that. We could ask him. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come up with a C Index before I see you guys next. Uh, I would like to know what's in the C Index. I have to figure that out. All right. <laughs> but it's going to have something to do with woolly mammoths. Oh, no. And thiamine. Ooh, oh. And bees. And bees. So that is the end of our program. If you have any feedback on this or any other episode, or you want to suggest a topic or a study for us to take on, you can tweet us at at PopHealthEX, or you can tweet me at at ProfMadFox, or Chris at at ID.Gill. No, apparently nobody does. <laughs> or Don at, at DThea1. Or you can I want find my us, 13th follower. Or you can find us on it's the Population <laughs> Health Exchange website at www. Maybe the 13th follower will be Kim Kardashian. PopHealthEx.org. <laughs> we want to thank Leslie Talali, a director of lifelong learning at the BU School of Public Health, for supporting the podcast, and Nick Guler for sound and editing. Thanks for joining us, and please download our next episode.